When we defined the electric field, we used an analogy with gravity. So follow me along here, or follow along with me here as I try and introduce another set of terms to you. Uh, and I'm going to use gravity in order to help us understand it. Because we understand gravity really well, and gravity has a lot of um, parallels. So I'm going to just talk about this in terms of energy, considerations, with the elect, uh, with elect the electric field. Easiest way to say that then. So the first and foremost thing I'm going to say that uh, in the same way that a mass in a gravitational field experiences two things. One, it experiences a gravitational force, or as we commonly call this, a weight. It also experiences, well, experience is probably a wrong word. Um, uh, it also has, so let me put that actually here, experiences or has gravitational potential energy, right? We're going to make an analogy here and say a charge in an electric field experiences slash, actually I'll leave that off here. We'll say experiences an electrostatic force or Coulomb force and has an electrical potential energy, right? So let's just do our nomenclature here, Fg, F sub e. Here we use P, E sub G, but for reasons why I joked about before, we're gonna say E, P, E here, okay? Now, why is, char why is this notion gonna be more complicated than this one? Very simply, remember, mass only has one flavor, Therefore, in a gravitational uh, field, every mass goes in the same direction, but charge, because it has multiple flavors, uh, positive charges go in a different direction than negative charges in that same very field. Okay, so with all that being said, let's keep this nice and simple. We're going to use an analogy. So let's say that here is the Earth, right? Uh, so here's uh, the ground. That means that every object in this space would experience a gravitational force downwards. So we could actually say that the direction of the gravitational field here is little g downwards. Now, what do I know about that gravitational field in this region? Well, I know the strength of that field. Little g in this region, if this is the ground, this is Earth, is 9.8 newtons per kilogram, right? We know that, 9.8 newtons per kilogram downwards. So the electrical field in this region is uniform. Keep that in mind. So here we go. Let's pick a spot. Let's say here. Let's say that that spot is one meter above the ground. And I put a one kilogram mass at that position. So one kg at that position. And we'll call this position A. So what do we know about that object at that position? Well, let's talk about potential energy due to gravity and what's that equation? Well, that's gonna be m, g, and then h for the height above the ground, okay? m, g, h. So using m, g, h, one kilogram times 9.8 newtons per kilogram times one meter, that means that this object, A, would have 9.8 joules of energy, right? So that's its capacity to affect the environment. Okay, so here we go. Let's say um, equally one uh, meter above the ground, I put a two kilogram mass at this position. And actually I'm gonna just draw a little dotted line here at that one meter height. 
How much energy would this object have? Well, I think it's pretty clear, 19.6 joules, okay? So, I want you to notice a couple of things. First, no matter where this one kilogram mass would be along this dotted line, it would have a potential energy of 9.8 joules. No matter where this two kilogram object is along this line, it would have a 19 point, would have 19.6, uh, uh, joules of potential energy. So I'm going to name this line here, this dotted line, is going to be something called an equipotential line. Kind of sounds pretty much uh, what it is. It is a line along which a given object can move but have constant potential energy. Now, there's a lie somewhere in that sentence. Can you figure out what the lie is? It's not really a lie, it's more of a, an imprecision. I'm gonna tell you that the lie, or the imprecision here, is actually the word line. Because if this is the Earth, the Earth is a flat surface. This thing here, since we're just looking at a cross section, it's not actually a line, it's actually an entire plane. So these are not actually equipotential lines, even though that tends to be the way that they get talked about in the literature. Um, we're gonna notice that these are actually equipotential surfaces. So it's a surface, okay? Um, I don't know why in intro uh, literature that they tend to wanna to avoid the word uh, surface, um, but there it is. All right, here we go. Let's say then uh, I have point B, which is one meter again above point A, okay? And so here is B. So I can actually make another equipotential surface here because I think we'd all understand that if I'm two meters above the ground, no matter where I am two meters above the ground, that object would have an, uh, the same potential energy at every point along this surface. So uh, position B. Well, what would be true about our one kilogram mass at position B? Well, hopefully we would go, okay, uh, mass is one kilogram, 9.8 newtons per kilogram, but two meters above the ground, so 19.6 joules. Oh, so interestingly enough, um, our one kilogram mass has the same capacity to affect the environment as the two kilogram mass does down here. But let's talk about our two kilogram mass. The two kilogram mass at this position, right, if this is the two kg, uh, would have two kilograms times 9.8 newtons per kilogram times two meters or 39.2 joules. All right. And then I see, hopefully you see where I'm going here. I've got one, kilo, uh, one meter up again. We're gonna call this position C. We're gonna draw another equipotential surface, or at least the cross section thereof. Boom, boom, boom. And here's our one kilogram mass. And then if I plug that into the equation, 29.4 joules. And then this two kilogram mass um, would be, uh, what is this, 58.8. Jules. Okay, great. So, a <clears throat> couple of things that I want you to notice here. First, if I were to draw the gravitational field in here, what would you notice about it? Well, here would be a gravitational field line, a line that shows the direction of the gravitational force at any point, right? I have a series of lines there. Hopefully what we're seeing here is that our equipotential surfaces are always perpendicular to the field lines, right? Perpendicular, 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 perpendicular. So that is not happenstance. Uh, so that's an interesting thing. Let's see what else can we notice here. Okay. Hmm. So notice here that uh, this object, A, has 9.8 joules of energy. Uh, this object here has 19.6 joules of energy. 
If I were to put a three kilogram mass here, right? That's three kilograms. How much energy would it have? Yep, 29.4 joules. If I were to put the three kilogram mass here, how much energy would it have? 58.8 joules. If I put the three kilogram mass here, how much energy would it have? 70, hold on, um, no, 88.2 joules, right? Okay. Yeah, great. So, hmm. But interestingly, notice at this equal potential line, different masses have different amounts of potential energy. At this equal potential line, different masses have different amounts of potential energy, and same thing here. But what I want you to notice here, there is something that's the same for all of these three things. And it's not the amount of potential energy that they have. But at line A, I'm going to write this sentence out. At surface A, for each kilogram of mass placed at that location in space, 9.8 joules of energy per kilogram is the potential energy it has, right? This two kilogram mass, 19.6, 29.4 for the three kilogram mass. A five kilogram mass would have 49 joules of potential energy. So there's something here about this position at space that for each one kilogram of mass I put there, it has 9.8 joules of energy. Even if I don't put anything at this location in space, if I were to put something there, it would have 9.8 joules per kilogram. So that's something that's, uh, that's about this level in space, whether or not I have mass there. Notice for this line, for every bit of mass I put there, for every kilogram of mass I put there, there's 19.6 joules of energy per kilogram. For here, it's 29.4 joules per kilogram. Here, once again, 9.8 joules per kilogram, right? So that's what I want to describe right now. And this, so the terminology here is a little confusing, so just go with me. That number is going to be called the gravitational potential. Not the potential energy, the gravitational potential, okay? Because it's not an actual amount of energy. 9.8 joules per kilogram just tells you how much potential energy something would have if it were to be placed at the location of space. If there's no mass there, there's no potential energy stored, right? It just reveals something descriptive about that position in space. So that's what this is, gravitational potential is a description about a location space that reveals whoa, the energy stored per unit mass at I'm writing the words, I'm doing the symbol there, at that location, okay? So it's energy per mass potential. Notice then that if I know the amount of mass and I know the potential of that location, I can figure out what the energy is. So that is the concept here, the notion of gravitational potential, a description of that location in space that tells us how much energy is stored per unit mass. Now, another link that we need to make, and then we're gonna look at this in the electrical sense. 
you will notice each time, well, so here, if I am moving along the field line here, right, I'm actually gonna go in the opposite direction along the field line here. Notice, every time I move one meter along the field, the potential changes by 9.8 joules per kilogram, okay? So I'm going to describe something here, which is, I'm gonna give a little space here, the change in potential per unit uh, displacement, okay? The change in potential per unit displacement, or a better way to say that this is how the potential changes through changes in space. Hmm. So we're gonna go back, go back, go back, go back, go back, go back, go back to uh, something that we talked about before. Do you remember at the beginning of the year we had a bunch of discussions about different types of changes and you all wanted to call everything a rate. What's a rate? Hopefully what you remember is a rate is how something changes uh, through changes in time. For example, velocity is how your position changes through time. Acceleration is how your uh, velocity changes through time. Net force is how your momentum changes through time. Power is how your energy changes through time. But here we don't have change per time, we have change per displacement. This is a very specific type of ratio. Hopefully you remember what it is because we did talk about it. If you didn't, well, that's something that's called a gradient. And the example we gave was walking down the hallway into the science wing. As you walk down that hallway, the temperature changed as you changed through that space. So what we have here is something that's called the potential gradient. Because uh, this measure talks about how the gravitational potential changes as you change through space. Okay, so potential gradient. Now something changes per unit position, right? So it changes through space. So why do I care about that? Notice in this space, because we're gonna use this to build an argument. What's the potential gradient? Well, as I said, each time I move one meter, the potential changes by 9.8 joules per kilogram. And that's sort of interesting. The potential gradient here is constant because I change the same amount of potential every time I move the same distance along that field. Notice here, if I were to move along this way, the potential gradient would be zero because every time I would move over a certain amount, the potential doesn't change. It's always 19.6. Notice then, therefore, I only get a potential gradient as I go along the field line. So there's gonna be a link, therefore, between potential gradient and this field. Even better. Ready? The potential gradient in this region is constant. Do you know what else is constant in this region? The field is, okay? So the field is constant and the potential gradient is constant. Moving along the potential, over the, excuse me, moving along the field, I get a potential gradient. Now, even better, <laughs> every time I change one meter, the potential changes by how much? 9.8 joules per kilogram. Oh, what's the strength of the field here? 9.8 newtons per kilogram. But hold on, I move 9.8 joules per kilogram each meter. Well, what's a joule? Hopefully you remember a joule is a newton meter. 9.8 Newton meters per kilogram divided by one meter. Meters cancel. 9.8 newtons per kilogram. There it is. And so the link that we get here is that the potential gradient is the same thing as the strength of the related field. Okay? And the last thing I want you to notice here is what direction 
does the field point? The field points towards lower potentials, right? Okay, and the field points towards lower potentials. All right, so what does that, what does this mean in terms of the electric field and all this? So let's go um, and make a link. Let's uh, do something nice and simple. For example, we'll look at a parallel plate capacitor and I'll draw my parallel plate capacitor such that this is positive and that is negative. There you go, boom, boom, boom. And what we're gonna do here is we're gonna define all these things in terms of what's going on. Now, why are we using the parallel plate capacitor? Remember that the electric field is constant in the parallel plate capacitor. Because I wanna make that analogy to here where the gravitational field was positive. All right, I'm gonna pick three points in space in this field. A, B, and C. Okay, so if I were to put a positive charge at each position, what would happen to each? Okay, N not, not simultaneously, one at a time. So a little bit of positive there at A, a little positive at B, a little positive at C. Well, hopefully what you would see is they would move along the field line, right, and go crash into the negative plate. So my question therefore would be is which position would have a positive charge moving the fastest? when it hit the negative plate, okay? Well, hopefully what you figured out then is that um, it would be position C, right? So V final for C would be greater than V final, actually let's go magnitudes here because I care about the speeds. V final for the one with B, um, V final for the one at A, right? Why is that? Oh, well, if you want to think about it, C has the greatest, and for lack of a better term, we'll put it in bunny ears here, uh, falling distance. And it's weird to say it falls upwards, but meh, what does it matter? So C is the greatest falling distance. Okay, now remember, we're trying to bring this into energy. So that means that if this thing has the greatest speed, that the kinetic energy finally for the object that started at A had to be, uh, or at C, is greater than the kinetic energy, uh, finally, for the object that started at B, is greater than the kinetic energy, finally, uh, for the object at, at A. So if this thing has eventually more kinetic energy, what that must mean then is that the object that started at C must have had a greater electrical potential energy. So the electrical potential energy at C for this particle is greater than the electrical potential energy for B is greater than the electrical potential energy uh, for A. So there you go, right? So that's the notion of electrical potential energy. We can derive its existence from knowing that if we place this in a field, it would pick up kinetic energy. Awesome. <coughs> so what does that mean for us then? Well. <coughs> Very simple. If I place, where else could I place an, a, a positive particle such that it would have the same amount of electrical potential energy as something at C? Well, uh, anywhere along this line. So what are we gonna call this line? Hopefully you figured out that is gonna be an equal potential line. Same thing here at B, there's an equal potential line. Same thing here at A, equal potential line. Oh my God, look at that. I've got a field and it's perpendicular to my equal potential lines. Right, so then what we're going to do from there is look at a slightly different question. So which position would have a positive charge moving the fastest when it hit the negative plate? The related question we're gonna look at is see which position would A, 
negative charge. Um, be moving the fastest when it hit. In this case, where would it hit? It would hit the positive plate if initially pre uh, placed there. So hopefully what you're seeing here is, well, where would a negative particle have a greater speed? Well, that's going to be a and position A because here it has it's going to go down so it's going to have a longer distance to fall there. So oddly enough then the exact opposite is true for a negative particle. The electrical potential energy for a particle at A would be greater than the electrical potential energy for a particle at B would be greater than the electrical potential energy for a particle at C. So because this notion of charge and flavor, the notion of potential energy is just a little bit more complicated. What we can say is that the electrical potential energy is going to be related to what we will call the falling distance. The further an object is from where it wants to go, the greater the amount of electrical potential energy that it has. And that's going to be an overarching notion. But let's get back to it. In the same way that we talked about um, electrical potential energy, or the some gravitational potential energy at a certain spot, spot well, um, we're going to talk about this thing having electrical potential energy. But remember what we said about the gravitational potential energy. We said that every point along this line, that there was something about this point, right, this location in space, that, that for every bit of mass in the, when we were doing gravity that you put at this point, you had a certain amount of gravitational potential energy. But what we're going to talk about here is I'm not talking about gravitational potential energy. I'm talking about electrical potential energy. So there must be some sort of related concept. And there is, and we're going to call it electric potential. Not electric potential energy, but electric potential. And if we go back to our other work, we can figure out its definition. It's going to be a description about a location in space that reveals the energy stored per unit, and here's going to be the difference, charge at that location, and I probably should now say in an electric field. So all these different points in the electric field are going to have different electric potentials. So here, because I'm actually going to start quantifying this, I'm going to give it a symbol. And the symbol we're going to give it is capital V, but we're going to put like little wing type things there. I know you're going to see why in a minute. So therefore, I'm going to define V, the electric potential, to be the energy per unit charge. Now, what charge is that? That's not the source charge, that is the charge at that location in space. So if I'm going to turn this into a real equation here, energy, this energy very specifically is electrical potential energy, and the charge is Q naught. And there we go. That's what I get in terms of my definition, the energy per unit charge at that location in space. So let's look at the units then of this concept of electrical potential, that's going to be a joule per coulomb. coulomb. And joule per coulomb occurs so often in nature that it's given its own term, and that's called the volt, which we shorten to just V. And now hopefully I think you, you can see why I'm doing this crazy looking V for the electrical potential term, but it's just going to be uppercase V for the unit. But you've heard of, 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 of uh, volts before, I'm sure. So where have you heard of volts? Hopefully what you're thinking about is a battery. But that is not electrical potential, uh, although it is related to it. And so we'll come back to that in just a minute. So that must mean that these three lines have very specific electrical potentials. 
So I have an electric potential at C, an electric potential at B, an electric potential at A. So those are not the same though. Um, there's a difference between these. So let's talk about that. Well, which is gonna be biggest? Well, here's the, here's the crazy thing, right? Notice we said that a positive charge would have the most electrical potential energy here and the least here. A negative particle would have the most electrical potential energy here and the least here because uh, a negative would have most here, least here, excuse me, and a positive most here and least here. Wow, I misspoke. But um, we, ha we have to define this in a uniform fashion in the same way that we defined it, um, we defined everything for electric fields. So electric potential is gonna be defined in terms of what's happening with a positive particle, such that this Vc is going to be greater than Vb, which is gonna be greater than Va, right? So meaning the positive plate is gonna be at a higher potential than the negative plate, which means a couple of things. First, positive particles tend then naturally to want to move towards lower potentials. But negative particles tend to want to naturally, excuse me, to want to move towards higher potentials. And that's just the unfortunate way uh, that all this gets defined because everything is defined in terms of what's true about a positive particle in the same way that the electric field shows what's happening with a positive particle. But we should note that all charges want to move towards lower electric potential energies, okay? That's just the description of what's going on here. Okay, so now let's get back to it. I know this is long, folks. I know this is long. Um, so what we're gonna talk about here is then, well, what happens when you go from here to here? Well, if a particle, let's say a positive particle moves from here to here, we know that it would p naturally pick up speed and then it would pick up speed here. It would experience a change in kinetic energy. If I have a positive particle at A and I wanna bring it to B, it wouldn't naturally do that. I would have to force it to go from A to B and increase its potential energy, yes? Hmm. So no matter what, if I move between these equal potential surfaces, energy is gonna change. If it's happening naturally, um, generally it is uh, uh, an increase in kinetic energy and a decrease in potential energy, right? Uh, if I'm forcing it, usually I am just taking uh, a certain amount of potential energy and changing it to a different amount of potential energy. But no matter what, I'm changing energy. Change in energy, change in energy. Where do I know that? So if I wanna bring this positive particle from A to B, I wanna change its energy, I have to do and hopefully you just said to yourself, work. This is the last thing we wanna talk about, a second to the last thing we wanna talk about. To move between equipotential lines requires work to be done. And remember, work is just a change in energy. So if work is a change in energy, right? Notice before I had V is equal to EPE over Q naught. If I just want to talk about change, I just put a change there. This change in electrical potential energy, I can just replace with the concept of work, right? And so I get this new equation here that the change in potential is equal to the work done per unit charge, okay? And so here's the thing. Delta V is called potential difference. 
but you may know it by its other name, voltage. And that's what we're talking about when we talk about a battery, folks. This AA battery, which has 1.5 volts, that's not a potential. That is the potential difference between the negative end and the positive end, right? Meaning that what this battery is doing is it's doing work on charged particles, all right? So what, how much work? Work is equal to uh, the charge times delta V. And this video is getting really long, so I'm actually going to stop it here. We're gonna pick up with this concept in another video.